No, ex exactly. We, uh, no, it's, yeah, it's not too nice today. We were actually, we were supposed to go up to Ames Golf today and rate, uh, and basically uh, paint the golf course for a college event on Monday, um, but I pushed it back till tomorrow. So it's kind of, yeah, I'm kind of not upset about that with the weather being as nasty as it was this morning. Um, these make rules meetings kind of make up for uh, make up those days you can't get out there, I guess. Yeah, tomorrow's gonna be a little bit warmer, but I think it's gonna be windy. Yeah, so hopefully it'll dry everything up for you. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I might get some paint spray on more. <laughs> So are Chad and Caitlin away on official business or is this more fun? You know, uh, actually this is kind of more fun for them, which is rare. Um, they generally don't take a lot of vacations, but Chad's out, out in uh, out West, uh, abandoned dunes playing golf with a couple close friends. And then Caitlin is actually down in Florida watching her sister play baseball for Luther. So she's-, hmm. she's There's something going on between here and the projector. Yeah, so she's playing. Yeah. Because it's being. Maybe playing a little golf down there, too. So. Looks like there's a pretty steady flow of people coming in. So I've. Yeah. Looking a lot. <laughs> I think the bad weather helps us. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Well, we're looking forward to, to working your guys' uh, championships again this year. We'll, uh, we've kind of already got the plan of who's going to be going where and, and uh, doing all the prep for that. So we're, we're excited to, to be a part of that again. Good. You guys have been great partners. Oh, thank you. Oh, it's been fun. It's nice to be, uh, be involved and it's kind of gives us a chance to get to know a lot of the girls and, and kind of catch them early before they get get uh, into college, um, you know, where you kind of can build maybe some relationships with them a little bit in the summers when they play at some of our events. So that's so really nice. Yeah. It is. And we've got a new course this year with Pheasant Ridge in Cedar Falls. Yeah. Yeah, that'll be really nice. And I think with you and I right there, I mean, I'm assuming, you know, Coach Burma will probably be, be out there all uh, for the whole championship so that's kind of cool to have, have i that told right. coach Bermel that that's where my team played my senior year for our state golf okay run. it right. rained the whole time <laughs> yeah we had a couple of those years too in the in the fall but yeah it's i feel like playing golf in iowa you just get so you just you get about everything it seems like it yeah. one, one year or the other but we've had some some interesting days I said my memories were still fond of Pheasant Ridge despite the weather. Nice. You know, I haven't played there, but I know Carly is probably, she's played mm -hmm. there a little bit and um, I'll introduce everybody to Carly as well once we, we kind of get started. But she, uh, um, a lot of you might know her, she did play high school golf for Centennial and college golf at South Dakota and and uh, um, and, and Grandview, so. so be nice to have her on, on board with us. She's not too far out from the high school experience. No, <laughs> no, it's only been a couple of years. <laughs> <laughs> it feels like yesterday for me, but it's gosh, it's already been uh, it'd be almost 15 years now since I since I've left. So it's, where did uh, you play high school golf, Nate? I played at Dowling um, back in the day. So um, graduated in, in 08. So it's yeah, it felt like felt like yesterday, but what was your home course at Dowling? We played at uh, the Legacy in Norwalk, and uh, we played a few other places too. Like we we practiced once in a while at Wakanda, and we'd go out to 
um, you know, uh, Beaver Creek and a few other places. So um, it was good. I don't know if my old coach is on, uh, Coach Gray, but he, uh, if he is, um, I don't see his name. I, he, Definitely chime in if you are, Coach. It'd be good to hear from you. It's just been a walk down memory lane for you, Nate, hasn't it? I know, I know. <laughs> yeah, there's some, a lot of good people um, involved in high school golf, so it's uh, it's definitely and that. Still, I look back, I and mean, a lot of my old teammates, we still look back and we say it was, you know, really the best time of our lives. I mean, high school golf was. I, I probably enjoyed it even more than college golf. So um, it was, it was a blast. All right. So I think we're past four o'clock. So I, I guess I'll keep letting people in as they come, but if we yeah. want to get started, uh, I'll let Carly, it's her computer. So I'm going to let her kind of get everything kind of situated and then we'll, we'll start. All right. So should I just put that down here, you think? Or... Yeah. Okay. All right, guys. Well, we'll get started. Um, and I'm going to make sure I can still let people in. So I'm going to make sure that I can Let's just see. Do you know if I can? Uh, I think you should hit this that one. Maybe, yeah. And it should pop up, maybe. It should, yeah. Okay. Well, we'll get started. Uh, all right. So uh, for the couple of you that might know me, uh, my name is Nate McCoy. Um, and I'm the manager of, uh, of handicapping and course rating. With the yeah, because that's only for us if we were speaking, I believe. So it's not going to give us the sound. All right. So that's yeah. a great reminder. If you don't have your computer on mute and you don't know how to put it on mute, just ask one of the students that are in the meeting with you. They'll know how to make sure you mute yourself. Oh, thank you. Um, and then this is Carly Kerrigan. She, uh, as I just kind of did introduce her, uh, but she, she's here in Ankeny. We're both, both now live in Ankeny, but uh, really good player. Um, Carly was a state champion at Centennial, um, and I was a state champion at Dowling. So we both uh, uh, have a lot of heart for uh, high school golf, and and uh, you know it's really down in our bones. And um, obviously the rules are important to us, and we think that uh, you know it's important to know know the rules and kind of know uh, know how to apply them in the, on the golf course. So we're going to try to give you a, at least an overview of kind of some of the main ones. Uh, this is obviously not going to be everything because uh, to tell you the truth, if we go through everything, it would almost take us probably four days, um, which is a lot of time. So we're going to give you kind of a, a main rundown of it. And, and uh, at the end of it, if you have questions, you know, definitely reach out to us uh, through this or, or, We'll give you our emails so you can email us directly, but we'd, uh, you know, we want to keep the conversation going. So don't, don't hesitate to, to ask us if you have any, if you have any questions come up. Um, let's see if I can get this to play. Do you know how? Nate, do you want to offer the possibility of them putting a question in the chat? Oh, uh, you'd be able to, if you yeah, monitor we, that. Yeah, we can. I think Carly is able to, to see that come through mm -hmm. right so yeah if they want to put that that in we can definitely uh we can definitely see it if you do you have the ability to see it on your end as well yes okay if you maybe in case i don't see it if you want to just stop me anytime um we can we can stop during the presentation and we can try to answer that so okay um all right so uh basically we're just going to cover um a, a few main things. The first is the five areas of the golf course. And as we'll see, this is kind of an important baseline to start from uh, in understanding the rules. Um, Carly's going to cover dropping and the procedures for that. I'll cover uh, nearest point of complete relief and abnormal course conditions. Um, Carly's gonna, then going to cover uh, when a ball is lost or out of bounds and how to play a provisional ball. Um, then I'll jump in and finish up with penalty areas, uh, playing two golf balls. So basically when you have uncertain um, situations out there on the golf course and you know, uh, proceed further uh, without having to delay play. And then we'll have another period for question and answers. Uh, if you haven't, you know, didn't answer, get your question answered during the presentation. So, um, okay, so we'll start. Um, 
Now there are five areas of the golf course and obviously you've probably heard this many times by now. Uh, this was kind of a change in 2019, but um, basically- Do you need a better speaker? How about this? We have, a, we have. All right. Okay, there we go. Um, so we're gonna start. So basically the general area um, is kind of the main area of the golf course. And this is gonna cover basically the entire golf course. So this is like your fairway, your rough, um, any area that's not marked, you know, marked with uh, paint is probably gonna be considered in the general area. And this is gonna cover everything, like I said, except for these other four specific areas, um, which are outlined in rule 2.2B. Um, those areas um, are really important for us to understand because basically certain rules are gonna apply um, in these areas that are not necessarily in the general area. So you might be taking different relief procedures and, and, and uh, you know, doing things that are gonna allow you to continue on playing, playing golf uh, and obviously not having broken that chain. You know, obviously they look at golf as kind of a, when you play a hole, it's basically a, a chain. And, and so once that chain's broken because you hit it in the penalty area or you hit it, um, you know, and lost your ball for some reason, then, you know, obviously that chain's broken. So then these other rules are, are in place to basically kind of reattach that chain and let you finish, finish playing the, the hole and, and allowing you to complete your round. So we'll start in uh, the first area of the, they call them the specific areas, but we're going to call it, uh, the first one is going to be the teen area. And basically the teen area uh, is the area that the player must use in starting the hole he or she is playing. So any other teen area on the golf course is gonna be treated as the general area. So um, it's, it's kind of unique um, as you might've heard in other rules, you know, uh, meetings or rule seminars, um, some of the rule changes that happened with teen areas that, that came about in 2019 uh, include some stuff like, um, for example, if your ball happens to, let's say you hit a tee shot and it comes back and it's resting on that teen area and it's inside that box that you see in this, this picture here, you're actually able to pick that ball up and actually re-tee it. So um, that's just one thing that, that I just wanted to point out. It's, I would say I would definitely look at rule 6.2 um, if you're looking, wanting to get more info on the teen area, but it's um, just so you know, if your ball happens to be in any other teen area on the golf course, except for the one that you're using to start play of a hole, um, it's gonna be just treated as the general area. Okay, number two is all bunkers. And this can be found in rule 12. Basically all bunkers on the golf course are gonna be treated um, the same. The third one is all penalty areas. And as we'll cover later in rule 17, uh, all penalty areas are basically gonna be red or marked red or yellow. and there's different uh, procedures and different uh, um, uh, things al allowed under each one that we'll, we'll cover, but, but uh, red's gonna be the most common. And I'd say if you are in doubt, say if you're marking a golf course for some reason for an event, uh, if you are in doubt whether you should mark it yellow or red, I would just say, just mark it red. Um, you're not gonna have any problems if you do. And, and it kind of alleviates a lot of confusion. And lastly, uh, we're going to talk about, uh, or I guess the other area would be the, the, the putting green and it's the putting green of the hole that the player is playing. And so what that means is that there's a lot of rules um, that are available to you for accidental movement, for example, or uh, situations where, uh, you know, like you might've saw recently, uh, you know, where a ball might've blown off uh, the green or, you know, and there's, there's different procedures that, that are under this rule that, if it's on the green that you're playing, uh, on the hole that you're playing, then you have a lot of uh, kind of some, a little bit more leeway than you used to in the past. Um, now, any other green on the golf course is just gonna be considered a wrong green and you'll have to take relief to get off of it. But um, as you'll notice, uh, you know, the teen area and the putting green are kind of the two areas that are very specific to the hole that you're playing and everything else is basically gonna be, you know, on the golf course uh, kind of treated the same way. So those are kind of the four other specific areas. Um, you know, why is it important uh, that we know which area the golf ball is lying in? And that's because um, basically there's gonna be certain rules that are gonna apply in playing a ball and taking relief that, you know, we basically have to figure out 
you know, which one is the ball like, you know, resting in is the ball in the general area or is the ball in one of these other four specific areas and the ball is always going to be treated as lying in only one area of the golf course. So, uh, you know, if, if you look at this picture on the right, you have a ball that's half, half in the general area and touching, you know, it's also touching the penalty area. Well, um, under this rule, um, basically, um, the ball is always going to be treated as touching or being in one of these other specific areas. So, for example, if your ball is on the fringe, which is now, which is what we consider the general area, and it's and it's got one dimple touching the putting green, that ball is actually going to be considered on the putting green uh, if it's resting on that putting green. Um, if it's touching sand, um, it's obviously going to be considered uh, in the sand, uh, same way as, as this picture is showing. If your ball is touching the general area, but any bit of it is touching the penalty area, it's going to be treated as being in the penalty area. So if that helps, basically the other area is always going to win out. All right. So that's that's just kind of an overview of just the general, you know, the general area and all the other areas. Um, it's just kind of important to kind of get that baseline of knowing kind of where those balls, balls are lying and kind of what the status is of that ball. Um, you're going to see later on in our other these other presentations that we're going to cover uh, is that basically we always are talking about, you know, where the ball's at and general area is a very common one. So um, that's going to come up again uh, down the road. So we kind of just want to get you that baseline, but I'm going to let Carly take over. She's going to cover dropping with you guys just to make sure you understand the, the new changes with that, that came about in 2019. Okay. So rule 14.3 dropping. Uh, first thing to know is, what is the drop it's just when you're holding the ball and you let go of it and when you're doing this the intent is for that ball to be in play and so if a player lets go of the ball without intending for it to be in play it's not dropped and it's not in play uh, let's say you're on the putting green and you're cleaning your ball off and you drop it you're not intending for that ball to be in play you just accidentally dropped it so um, you're able to then play your ball from where you had previously marked it. Next, uh, each relief rule has a specific relief area where the ba ball must be dropped, but also where it has to come to rest. Uh, in these pictures, you can see the dotted line in the shaded area. That is where the ball is intended to be dropped and also where the ball must come to rest at. So one of the biggest changes with dropping that came in 2019 was you're no longer dropping from shoulder height, but rather knee height. And when a player is dropping, they just have to let go of the ball and have it fall straight down. They are not able to throw it, spin it, or roll it, or do anything to affect how the ball might land. They just simply need to let go of it and have it fall. Carly, there is a question that said, what happens if it hits your foot when you drop the ball? So the ball is not allowed to touch uh, the player's body or equipment before it hits the ground. Is it just That's a redrop? Uh, it, yeah, it would be a redrop in that mm -hmm. situation, but uh, and it, but uh, it is allowed to touch you. I think it actually maybe covers this in the next part of this, but it, it is allowed to touch you after it hits the ground first. So if it accidentally bumps into your foot after it touches the ground, um, in that case, you will just, you will, uh, as long as it's still in the relief area, um, basically that shaded wedge, then you can proceed with playing it. Uh, next, the area in which a player drops the ball and when taking relief, that is the shaded area down here that you see in these pictures. And the area is measured by uh, the size and location on reference point, as well as the size of relief areas measured or the reference point and limits on those uh, relief areas. So players will use the longest club in their bag during the round when figuring out the size of their relief area. However, if the player has a putter in their bag that is the longest club, they are not entitled to use that. So they would have to use the second longest club in their bag. So more often than not, you would see this with uh, people that use br like broom style putting. Uh, most putters aren't longer than drivers, so we don't have to worry about this. But if on the off chance your putter is the longest club in your bag, just remember that you are not allowed to use it to 
measure your relief area. And then uh, in defining player's teeing area on each hole, you are able to tee it up behind the markers uh, no more than two club lengths. So like Nate talked about earlier with that teeing area, um, you just have to make sure you're behind the markers, but you also do have a little bit of extra room if you know, you don't want to tee it up a couple inches behind the markers. You can move it a little further back using your longest club with the exception of a putter to figure out how much further uh, behind those markers you can go to tee it up. And so is there any question, any other questions with dropping? No? Okay. Okay. Yeah, so you kind of see we're kind of getting a lot of the baseline kind of uh, stuff early just so we understand because obviously dropping is kind of something that happens kind of across the board in a, in a lot of these rules. And so um, just making sure that we, we kind of get those basic basic ideas down um, really helps for when you when you dive into the rules uh, down the road. So obviously we're not showing everything um, today, but if you um, did decide to get into the rule book a little bit more or watch other videos that we have available, you're going to see that, you know, this, these dropping procedures are really kind of the same across the board. You're not going to see, see the procedure really change too much. So, um, so I'm going to cover, uh, uh, the nearest point of complete relief and abnormal course conditions. Um, this one, uh, this one's going to come up a lot, you know, in, in kind of your, day-to-day -day play. I mean, there's times you, you might have this happen in a three round tournament. You might have to take relief, you know, from stuff, you know, multiple times uh, in the tournament. So it's, it's very common. And uh, this is also going to include embedded ball. So we're going to talk about kind of the procedures for how you deal with an embedded ball, which, you know, this time of year, um, you know, obviously today we had a ton of rain, it's wet. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of, it's going to be common. You're going to have an embedded ball sometime in the spring, I'm, I'm sure. So so we'll kind of talk about how to how to deal with that. So skip over that. Um, all right. So so these uh, conditions so that we're going to cover. So all these abnormal course conditions are basically there um, in the rules, but they're not uh, treated as part of the challenge of playing the golf course. Right? And so you're generally going to get free relief um, unless you happen to be in the penalty area and if you're in the penalty area, obviously you're you're not going to be able to uh, take relief unless you want to take a penalty, which is which would be, you know, under the Rule 17 penalty area relief. So, um, the player is normally going to be able to take relief by dropping a, a ball in a relief area, and it's going to be based on the nearest complete nearest point of complete relief. And this is going to be the same with with about every drop you're going to have, you're always going to want to find that that nearest point of complete relief and and take your drop. Uh, there's just a few exceptions to that that we'll we'll cover. Um, and it's also going to cover um, this rule is also going to cover when when a ball's embedded and, and it's in its own pitch mark in the general area. So that's kind of what rule uh, 16 is kind of about. But if you have a question on kind of what an abnormal course condition is, um, these are really the four main um, abnormal course conditions that you're going to find out there. And the first one being animal holes. These, these actually used to be called burrowing animal holes, um, but they've kind of changed the term for this. Um, you know, in the past, if a dog uh, would have dug a hole, it would not have, and your ball was somehow affected by this, it wouldn't have actually given you relief because the dog is not considered a burrowing animal. But Thankfully, the rules kind of got things straight, um, at least on one thing, and they just considered any hole um, an animal hole. And so uh, I think it does have to be made by an insect or an animal, but um, it, is a, it, it is a nicer change than, than in the past. There's not too many animals that can dig big holes like that quickly besides, you know, unlike dogs. So, um, but uh, you'll also see ground under repair. Uh, that's gonna be um, usually outlined in white paint. Um, as you see in this picture here. Um, the third picture over, that's a movable obstruction. So that's gonna be like your cart paths or, or you know, maybe it's a permanent bench that's out there or, or something that's on the golf course that basically is is permanent. It's a, it's a movable and you're not necessarily meant to be playing off of it. Um, and then uh, the, th the fourth one is temporary water. And this used to be called casual water, um, but temporary water now, uh, 
encompasses a little bit more and uh, we'll kind of go into that a little bit too. Um, but uh, now this rule, it's not gonna give you relief from boundary objects. So these boundary objects are, and integral objects are not necessarily considered abnormal course conditions. Um, they're, uh, they're kind of there for, for kind of outlining the, the golf course and, and kind of setting the, the boundary for it. So, so what is a boundary object? And really a boundary object is an artificial object defining or showing out of bounds, such as uh, walls, fences, stakes, and railings. Um, and re free relief is not gonna be allowed. So, um, uh, it, you know, obviously in Iowa, you know, we have a combination of all of these things um, that set the, kind of set the boundary. Um, you know, obviously they don't want you moving things because, you know, this is the boundary of the golf course and it needs to be the same for everybody that's playing. So um, if you did need to take relief, the, you know, and you, you didn't want to try to hit the ball if it was up against the fence, then you obviously could take um, unplayable ball relief. And uh, we're not necessarily going to cover that today, but um, you do have some options in the rules for that, um, which can get you away for it for from the object for just one penalty stroke. An integral object is an artificial object defined by the committee as, and the, I should mention the committee is is generally going to be, you know, coaches. It's going to be either the administrators of the golf tournament. Um, the head pro, um, if it's us, you know, the association, whoever's, whoever's kind of putting on the event, that's going to be defined, that's going to be the committee. And the committee is going to basically have to set the standards and the, the regulations for the golf course. And uh, part of what they define is, is what are objects on the golf course that are considered uh, integral and are considered part of the challenge of playing the golf course. Uh, and with these things, re relief is not going to be allowed uh, because it's supposed to be part of the challenge of playing the course. So as you see, this stone wall that's inside the penalty area is, um, you know, they, instead of making the, the outside, you know, the inside edge closest to the water, you know, the line, they basically brought the line on the course side, uh, making that stone wall an integral object. So if your ball happens to be on that stone wall, um, inside the penalty area, you don't necessarily get free relief for that. You, you would have to take penalty relief, uh, which is one stroke. Um, something, I don't know if you guys will be able to see it if you're sitting far away, but there is a cable on this tree. And I'm sure the science teachers, if there are some on this uh, call, might know maybe why. I'm, I'm assuming that's for grounding the, the tree in case of lightning, but uh, I believe this tree is at Hyperion. Um, it's one of their biggest trees out there. But um, obviously, if, if we as a, as a administrator would say, you know, that tree is, uh, is an integral object or that, that wire is an integral object and it's closely tied to the tree. So we're not necessarily gonna give you relief for it because it, that basically gets you away from the tree and that's not what we want. So um, there are some instances though with trees and, and in Iowa, especially we see a lot of courses that, that have planted trees that are small and they have wrappings around it. And those wrappings, um, if it's just wrapped around the tree and it's closely tied to it, we're going to say that that's an integral part of the course and we expect you not to take relief from it. Um, now, if it has wires and it has stakes, metal stakes that are um, outside that, um, basically kind of extending the, the width of the tree, uh, you know, that would be a decision where we would say, you know, that we would give you relief for the, the stakes. So I guess for any of you that are setting up tournaments and you have that type of stuff on your golf course, I would just say, you know, give it a little bit of thought, make sure that you don't uh, forget about those, those trees, because uh, um, depending on how they're, they're kind of put together and, and being held up, you know, you might either want to call them an integral object, or you might want to call it a, you know, some type of obstruction where they can get, they can get relief from. All right, so just to kind of jump into nearest point of complete relief, um, it's always going to start with a reference point. And so we're always, and no matter what we're doing, we're always trying to find the reference point first. And that's going to be whether we're doing this, you know, making this drop for a normal course condition, which is what we're talking about now, um, or if we're talking about dangerous animal conditions, wrong greens, um, no play zones, or taking other types of relief under certain local rules we're always gonna be trying to find our reference point first. So what is the reference point? Well, the reference point basically is the nearest um, point um, that uh, gets you off of or away from an, of, of the abnormal course condition um, 
uh, nearest to the ball's original spot, but not near the hole, then that spot. So we don't want to get, we can't get closer to the hole. Uh, and we have to go to wherever that closest point is from that ball that, that gets us that complete relief. Um, it must still be in the required area of the golf course. And uh, where the condition does not interfere with the stroke, the player would have made from the original spot if the condition was not there. So basically the way you would start doing this is that the first step would be, okay, what kind of shot do I want to hit? And what is my stand? Where's, how's my stance going to be? Um, you know, where's my intended line of play? Um, what kind of club am I going to use? And you would use, you would get all that together. You take the club out that you most likely would use. And then you would actually take your stance, uh, possibly even a practice swing. And, uh, and then you would, uh, um, you know, basically find your, find your location to take that relief. Um, this is not a recommended, uh, this isn't recommended that you have to do all the time, but um, I, I know that I, even my, myself at, at the high level that I play, I still do this all the time where I want to make sure that I'm following the rule correctly. So I'd like to maybe go back to this picture again and just show you. So, you know, the ball is obviously in the middle of the cart path and if it's in the middle of the cart path like this, if you're a left-handed player, as you can see by that picture, I mean, you're left-handed, you might, you'll probably have to go to the right side of the path. Uh, a right-handed player, obviously, uh, you know, the ball is, is completely off of the cart path. Um, his stance has no uh, interference. His swing has no interference. Um, so for this player, particularly, it's easier for him to go left um, of the cart path and, and, and have, the shortest amount of space between that ball and where he's dropping. So um, we'll talk a little bit about where, what that reference area is going to look like and all that, but um, hopefully this makes sense. And um, you know, you're not always going to take, you're not always going to pick which side you're going to go to. You kind of have to go to the side that's the closest that's going to get you complete relief. So here's a picture um, of a guy who basically his ball's on the right hand side of the cart path he is a right-handed player. So, um, you know, he's, he's kind of stuck, you know, he's, he's decided, you know, he's kind of right now, his ball is obviously still on the path. He's deciding, do I want to take relief here? Um, he's got, he's probably got the club he's most likely going to use for that shot. So he's, he's got his stance set. Um, and obviously this is a case where a player might have to give it a little bit more thought and, and kind of ask himself, do I want to take relief here? Because if I do, it might put me in a worse position. Um, now, obviously, he can play that ball off the cart path if he chooses. He might ruin his golf club or scratch it up. But uh, depending on the type of event or where he stands in the tournament, maybe it's worth a risk taking. Um, and so just give that some thought sometimes when you're out there. Uh, don't always just pick your ball up real quick. Uh, you know, kind of assess the situation and see what's around you. Um, all right. Now, so when, when are we allowed to take um, relief? And basically there's a, a few different things. There's three or four things that if, if we meet at least one of those things, if one of those things is true, um, then we have uh, the right to take relief. And basically I kind of covered a little bit of it, but if, you're, if your ball is touching or is in or on at a normal course condition, then that's one way you could get relief from something. Uh, if your stance, if you're standing on something, or if you're, um, you know, you're, you might be just barely touching it, where if you, once you take your swing, you, it might, with the movement of your feet, it might, might cause you to slip for somehow, um, you know, that would be a way that you could get relief from an object um, or one of these areas. Um, your swing might be imp impeded. So it might be something that on your backswing or your through swing, you might actually accidentally, you know, hit something um, and cause you to, you know, harm yourself or break your club. Um, so that's, that's obviously going to be a, a time where you can take relief and, uh, and get away from that, that uh, condition. Now, if we're on the putting green, um, this is the only time where, and, and I'm sure you guys have heard of this, um, you know, line of play, like, oh, you know, I get asked a lot at tournaments, you know, I, I want to take relief because that bathroom or that, you know, halfway house is, is on the line of my play and I don't want to have to hit over it. Well, on the golf course um, or in any of these other areas um, besides the putting green line of play doesn't necessarily get you away from anything unless it's affecting your, 
lie of the ball, your stance or area of intended swing. Um, if you're on the putting green though, line of play actually does come into play. So in, in this case, in this picture, you see the sprinkler head that is in the way of uh, this player's ball. Um, you see a lot, you see this happen a little bit more uh, when golf courses have maybe expanded their greens. They've gone through a green project and, and they've taken the greens out further than, than where the sprinkler heads were. And um, there might be a case where you might be, um, you know, having to putt through something like this. And in that case, you would be able to take relief and, uh, and uh, place the ball at your nearest point of complete relief and, and proceed. So um, I'll kind of cover one more thing before I jump into the greens. But uh, um, now there's obviously been times where you've been close to one of these objects, such as a sprinkler head, and you felt like it was maybe distracting you. It, it, you were kind of thinking, okay, it's probably not going to affect, I'm probably not going to hit it, but it's really distracting and it's going to maybe cause me to flinch because I don't want to have to like, you know, I don't want to hit it. And now in that case, if it's just distracting, um, you're not going to be able to get relief. Uh, there has to be a pretty good, um, pretty good uh, reason for you to, I mean, you, you really have to be close to, to hitting that thing for, for, for you to actually get relief. So just by being kind of distracting is not going to give you uh, the right to maybe call interference here and then take a, take a drop. So, um, you know, obviously sometimes those things are buried and the grass has kind of overgrown them a little bit. So you do have to kind of use some, some, uh, you know, some common sense. Cause obviously um, those things are bigger than they actually look. And sometimes they get a little overgrown. So um, just be careful um, if you are planning to hit a shot. Um, now relief is allowed anywhere on the golf course, except when a ball is in a penalty area. And I kind of covered that earlier. Um, here's an example, a picture of a, of a girl who's, who's uh, inside the penalty area. And she does have, she does have interference from this, uh, walking bridge. Now, normally if that ball was just in the general area and she was uh, trying to play the shot, she would get relief for that because that walking bridge is not part of, you know, the challenge of playing golf, but because she's in the penalty area, she is not able to take relief. And so she's going to have to, to take a one stroke penalty and proceed under the rule rule for penalty areas. Um, now, if a player's ball is in the general area and there is interference by a normal course condition, uh, the player may take free relief by dropping the original ball or another ball. So this is a time when, when the rules have changed a little bit. So originally, you were always supposed to, to have the original ball and play that ball throughout um, the hole until it was holed. Uh, now, the rules have changed a little bit. So any time that you're taking relief for a, for a situation, you're actually able to substitute another ball and uh, and play that ball. So in this case, if he takes relief from this cart path, he's actually able to, to grab another ball out of his bag and use that instead of the one that he had taken relief from. So that's that's a new new concept. Um, um, you know, if you just felt like you wanted to change it up, that's totally uh, up to you and, and inside the rules to do it. Okay, so now we're kind of getting into the actual, the actual relief area and uh, and you know, first, as I mentioned earlier, you know, the first thing you do is kind of find that reference point. And the nearest point of complete relief uh, in the general area is basically going to be, um, you know, uh, sorry, I guess I kind of got a little ahead of myself. But basically, um, if we just look at this picture, you know, this is a normal, abnormal course condition, ground under repair situation, middle of the fairway. Um, this is when a golfer, you know, you're going to find your nearest point of complete relief, which means you're going to get your fit, your feet, your um, the lie of the ball, and your area of intended swing. All those things are going to basically um, move out of that 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 condition. So you have complete relief from all those things, and then you're going to put a tee down where you have that relief, where you have that complete relief, and then you're going to measure um, with one club length, um, and uh, that's going to be your relief area, which is that shaded area. And I should mention one, the one club length uh, relief area is going to be the same for all abnormal course conditions. So there's no two club lengths for any of these abnormal course conditions. Um, you'll see here in the bunker, 
we have temporary water in the bunker, which is going to be really common in the spring. Uh, obviously, there's probably some courses even today that you could go out and see this um, with all the rain we've had. But um, same thing applies. You know, you're going to find your nearest point of complete relief, and you're going to put your um, T down. And uh, you do have the ability, it, it's something that I, we're not going to cover bunkers today, but something I should mention is that when you're measuring this relief area in the bunker, everybody's always afraid to let their club touch the sand in the bunker. If you are measuring for this relief area, you are able to put your club in the bunker and touch it. Um, that's one of the, one of the exemptions um, you're able to touch the sand with. Um, so don't be afraid if you want to put your driver down and measure and it happens to touch the sand, that's, that's okay. But uh, same thing applies here. You know, it's a one club length relief area. Um, under no penalty, you can drop in the bunker. Hey, Nate, real quick. One of the questions in the chat was, can you cover embedded ball in the hazard or bunker? Yeah, so uh, I think I'm, I am going to get to embedded ball, but I will say I can just touch on it now. Um, so embedded balls are not allowed in the bunker because uh, for one, that's a different area of the golf course, and it's also in sand, which I'll kind of share about later. And then uh, the other one was penalty. Was it penalty area you mentioned, or? Yeah, it said hazard and bunker. Oh, okay. So yeah, so so the penalty area would not, uh, which is formally called a hazard. Um, those you're not. You're also not allowed to take relief in a penalty area uh, for an embedded ball. So that's that's when you'd have to take that one stroke penalty relief and get out. Um, that way. So as you'll see in a second, um, all embedded ball relief is basically going to be um, in the general area. So um, there's something, there's another term um, I want to make you guys familiar with, um, which is called the point of maximum available relief. And in a bunker, and we'll cover it also in the green, this might mean that uh, when you're taking relief, let's say the bunker has so much water in it that uh, you actually can't take um, you can't take full relief because you're still going to be standing in it, or you're you might be dropping slightly in some more water, and so you kind of have to find your your spot of the the maximum available available relief, which which might mean that um, the best you can do is is just improve it slightly, um, and that's you know it's obviously if it gets that bad, you might want to consider uh, you know taking bunkers out of play or or suspending play if you're getting that much water, but um, just know that uh, you're still able to take maximum available relief in the bunker without a, without a penalty. Um, you'll see on, on the putting green, we're gonna have um, kind of a similar situation arise as well. But uh, if you're on a putting green, something that, um, the main thing I want you to, to know is, is, is that you're gonna be placing the ball. So, um, so uh, this example on the right, this picture, this golfer is a, a left-handed golfer. Um, his ball is uh, in the temporary water here on the green. Um, the player decided to take relief. So the person um, found his, his uh, nearest point of complete relief, which got him uh, completely off the water uh, with a stance and also the, the um, line of play. And then in, on, in anytime you're on the putting green, you're always placing the ball. So you're never gonna have to, even if you're taking relief, you're never gonna drop a ball on the putting green. You're always gonna place it. And uh, again, um, I just mentioned that you can place the original ball or another ball. So again, you can also, in this case, substitute another ball like you could, um, as I mentioned with that guy on the, on the cart path. Now here's a here's a, a situation. This happened to me uh, at a tournament where I was officiating um, a senior amateur championship. But basically, in this case, the, the nearest point of complete relief um, can either be on the putting green, but it, it can also be in the general area. So in the case that I had, it was at Des Moines Golf. We were we were uh, getting some rain, and he didn't want to putt through the water, which I completely understand why. Um, it was a very similar example is this and he decided to take relief and and I told him I said well we can't if you don't want to drop on if you don't want to place it on the green we can actually get you into the fringe um if that's okay and he said oh yeah that's fine that gets me gets me off the out of the the, the way of playing through the water and I'll, I'll take that so we moved him to the fringe and because his ball originally rested on the putting green he was actually able to place the ball on the fringe 
Um, so he wasn't having to drop on the fringe either because his ball was originated on the green. And so I think this next there, there's a picture. So it basically shows how he how he moved that ball over there to the to the fringe. Let's see if I can get it. There we go. Um, now, if there is no such nearest point of complete relief, the player may still take uh, free relief by using the, the point of maximum available relief as the reference point. So again, this is kind of like the bunker example, but a little different. Um, in this case, the, 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 the hole is basically surrounded by water. And instead of the, the player putting through it, he found a, the point where there was the least amount of water um, the ball was obviously no no closer to the hole, and in that case, the, the player decided to uh, place his ball there and and proceed. So now, as you see, I mean, you'd say, well, who would want to play a golf tournament where the there was that much water on the green and you had to, you know, still putt through it to get to get to the hole? And in that case, I would completely agree, and I would say, you know, we probably shouldn't be necessarily playing a tournament or an event that day, and and maybe give it a little time for the water to to subside. Um, again, this can either be on the putting green or the general area. Same, same, same as what we just talked about. So, and now we're into embedded ball. So we kind of just talked a little bit about it, um, but we're going to talk about kind of when the ball is considered embedded and determining if it's embedded and how do we do that. So relief is going to be allowed under Rule 16.3b, which is the embedded ball relief um, rule only when a player's ball is embedded in the general area. So this is kind of why it's important that we know which area of the golf course our ball is in, because you know, if it's in penalty areas, we can't take relief. If it's in bunkers, we can't take relief. If it's on the putting green, you know, obviously we can take relief because it's on the putting green. We can mark it, clean it, and fix the divot. Um, if it's on any other teeing area besides the one that we're playing, uh, for that hole, then obviously it's going to be considered general area. So in that case, you'd be able to, to take uh, relief, but um, that's why it's important to kind of know which area our ball is actually in. So there is no relief under this rule if the ball is embedded anywhere except the general area, which is what I just said. Um, some exceptions when you wouldn't get relief if it was in, if it was in the general area is if it was in uh, embedded in sand. And um, when it's not in the fairway. So if your ball is in sand and it's in the fairway, um, by some chance, you know, this would probably be if you were playing down in Florida or, or some other state that maybe has more of a sandy base soil. Uh, in that case, if it's in the fairway, um, they are going to let you take um, uh, relief for that if it's in sand. But if you're in some scrubby stuff, that's, you know, kind of where the rough and the you know, kind of where the rough's at, and it's in some sandy soil there, um, you, ne you wouldn't necessarily get relief for that. Um, you obviously aren't going to get relief for it in a bunker because that's, that is sand and that's a different area of the golf course. And, uh, um, and sand filled divots actually aren't going to, are not going to count for that either. So if you, obviously sand filled divots are very common, but uh, if it plugs in or if it embeds in that, that's, that's also another time you're not going to get, get relief. Um, but uh, how do you determine when a ball is embedded? And uh, basically, it's it's when the the ball um, is in its own pitch mark, made as re made as a result of the player's previous stroke, and part of the ball is below the level of the ground. So, in this case, you look at the top picture. You know, it is broken ground. It's broken the the plane of the ground, and it's also touching dirt. Um, the second second picture, it's broken the plane of the ground and it's but it's not necessarily touching dirt it's it's kind of compressed the grass down into a hole well that's also because it broke that plane it's actually going to be considered embedded um and obviously the third picture down there is it's just uh, resting on the grass and so um, it wouldn't be but um i had a situation so here i'm going to talk a little bit about the situation i had um something that really i didn't know at the time uh, until i looked it up but uh, basically, a ball is not going to be embedded um, if it's below the level of the ground as a result of, of something other than a player's previous stroke. So basically, if somebody's, you know, walking and steps on it because they're trying to search for it and they push it into the ground, obviously that's not going to be uh, embedded, but you're also going to have an option to take, uh, you know, to fix that and, and uh, you're not going to be 
liable for any penalties because you were, you know, you're looking for the ball at that point. And that's found in another rule uh, that we're not necessarily going to cover today. Um, but uh, um, the thing that I, I wanted to kind of talk about, which is kind of what shocked me is um, until I looked it up, because I, I wouldn't have known this, is that if the ball is just driven straight into the ground, it was so it was basically you that hit the shot, um, but it was driven straight into the ground without becoming airborne. Um, that uh, ball um, was not going to be considered uh, embedded. And I had a situation at a college event where I was officiating where a kid was in kind of some some taller fescue and took a whack at it. And uh, he never got it airborne and, and admitted that he never got it airborne and it drove it straight into the ground uh, deeper. And it was definitely embedded. But um, at that point, I wasn't able to give him relief because it never got airborne. And so he had to take relief under a the uh, the unplayable ball rule and uh, took a stroke penalty and, and then proceeded. So um, something that I, did, I didn't know and I thought it was kind of an interesting an interesting thing that came up. Um, and obviously if you're dropping a ball, say you're taking relief and you drop a ball from knee height and it kind of embeds in the ground because it's maybe wet, for example, that's a situation where you wouldn't get relief either, um, which uh, kind of seems harsh, but uh, maybe they'll change that one day because that, that doesn't seem too friendly. Um, okay, so how do you take relief for an embedded ball? And uh, I thought that this was a pretty simple one. Uh, you're basically going to take the original ball or another ball again, another substituted ball, and uh, you're going to find uh, a reference point, which is going to be right behind where the ball is embedded. And you're going to measure that uh, re you're going to measure that relief area with uh, one club length again. So as I mentioned earlier, everything's measured with one club length. And uh, you can't be that that area basically cannot be near the hole than where the, the reference point was, and it must stay in the general area. So um, as you see that that picture, it makes it pretty simple to, to understand. And and uh, and I know we had a lot of those a lot of those last year in a, in a couple of events we had, and and uh, you know it's it's definitely one you want to know. So, so that's rule 16. Um, I, I guess I can stop for a second if you guys have any questions. Uh, if not, I'll let Carly kind of proceed um, talking about the next one. Okay. Let's see. I'll let Carly, I'll let you get and take that one. Uh, so next, we'll look at lost ball or out of bounds and using a provisional ball. So a ball is lost or out of bounds when the ball played is not found within three minutes. And the biggest thing to note with this is the three minutes start once the player or his or her caddy begins to search for it. Uh, it's pretty common in high school events to have parents and spectators out there. So if you hit a ball off the tee and, you know, as you're walking up there, parents and spectators are able to look for that ball without that three minute clock starting. But the three minute clock will start as soon as the player that hit that ball is within the search area and begins looking for their ball. If a ball is found in that time, but it is uncertain as to whether or not it's that player's ball, uh, the player is able to attempt to identify this ball using rule 7.2. And so the, that player is able to do so in a reasonable amount of time. And if that happens after the three minute search has ended. So for example, let's say you're looking for your ball and at the two and a half minute mark, someone says, hey, I think this is your ball, come over and look at it. The two and a half minutes then stops. And if that ball, you walk over to it and it ends up not being yours, your three minutes will resume, but you only have that 30 seconds left to look for it. So anytime you're looking to identify a golf ball, that three minute time has stopped and then will resume as soon as you have identified the golf ball as not being yours. Uh, this includes a reasonable amount of time for the player to get to the ball, even if the player is not where the ball is found. So again, this is if you're searching in one area and someone is 20 yards away from you and says, hey, this might be your ball, come and identify it. That player has time to go and 
and walk that distance and identify the golf ball and it's not eating into their three minutes that they are given. Uh, if the player does not identify his or her ball in that three minutes, that means that the ball is lost. And so uh, when the ball is out of bounds, that means that the ball has come to rest outside of the boundary edge. So as we can see by these pictures, uh, the red X's mean that the ball is out of bounds and outside of the boundary edge. Uh, you'll see on the picture on the left, uh, there's a ball that is partially in the general area, partially out of bounds. Because part of that ball is in the general area, then it will be treated as being in that general area and in bounds and is able to be played. Yeah, I'm going to jump in real quick. Um, so this is the one time where, you know, how we how we discussed earlier about how, you know, all these, so if your ball's in the general area, but it's also touching another area, that the other area is always going to win out. Well, in this case, you know, out of bounds, and that isn't necessarily an area of the golf course. So, um, you know, if any part of the ball is actually touching the golf course, we're going to consider the ball then in, uh, in the golf, like on the golf course at that point. So, um, you know, it's, it's a, it's a little bit different. It's all, it's the only time it's kind of backwards um, from all the other, other situations that, that arise. But, but it, if you can kind of get that grasp, you know, basically if it's, if it's if any bit of it's touching the golf course, then then it's in. So just kind of wanted to make that clear because I know that it was different for the other situations. Sorry to jump in. No, you're good. Uh, and as you'll see on the picture on the right, there is a ball that is on that white boundary line because none of that ball is touching the green area. That ball is treated as being out of bounds. So just make note of that. If your ball happens to be on like a painted white line check to see if any part of the ball is within the area of the course. If none of it is, then unfortunately your ball will be uh, treated as being out of bounds and you will have to proceed carefully. Uh, when your ball is, so the ball is in bounds when it lies on or touches part of the ground or anything else. Like we said, it's inside of that boundary edge. Uh, another thing to note is if it's above the boundary edge or any other part of the course, this might happen if your ball is in a tree and uh, you know, you're know you not sure if, if it's technically in bounds or not. Um, that boundary line will go straight up. And if when that line goes straight up into the air, if your ball is on the course side of it, then the ball is treated as being in bounds. However, if it is not on the course side of that line going all the way up, then it will be treated as being out of bounds. Um, if your ball is in bounds, but your stance puts you out of bounds, that is okay. Because the ball is within the boundary lines of the course, then it is okay to play from there. Uh, what to do when the ball is lost or out of bounds. Uh, this is one of the only rules where you have to take stroke and distance relief. So you'll add one stroke penalty as well as you must play your next shot from where you played your previous stroke. So if you were teeing off and you hit your ball out of bounds or you lose your tee ball, you must go back to where you played your previous shot, which would be the teeing area. And if for some reason, if you, if you hit a shot and you think that it's inbounds and you walk up there and it ends up being out of bounds, uh, you'll need to walk back to the closest area as possible to where you played your previous shot. Um, and use, use your judgment to make sure that you're as close to that previous spot as possible if you cannot pinpoint it exactly. Okay, next up, we'll talk about provisional balls. So a provisional ball is another ball that is played in case the one you just hit may be out of bounds or could be lost outside of a penalty area. Something to note, a provisional ball is not the player's ball in play unless it becomes in play under rule 18.3, which we will discuss shortly. Provisional balls are allowed if a ball might be lost outside of a penalty area or out of bounds. The reason for this is it saves time for the player. That way uh, they don't have to walk back from where they previously played. It, it helps speed things up. Um, and so it's, it's really good for just making sure that you're staying on pace. In order to play a provisional ball, you must announce before you drop that ball and hit your stroke. Uh, you must say, 
um, the word provisional within it. You can't just say, I'm going to hit another ball or I'm just going to play again. Uh, so when using the word provisional, a couple of examples to clearly indicate that you're doing that would be I'm playing a ball under rule 18.3 or I'm going to play another ball just in case. Something you can't say is I'm going to play another or I'm going to reload. Uh, if in doubt, always err on using the word provisional. And when you do this, make sure that you are saying any identifying marks to your provisional. Uh, something that might happen is you'll say, I'm going to hit a provisional ball. My provisional is a Titleist three with a red dot. My first ball was a Titleist one with a blue dot. Uh, that way you and all the people you are playing with, they know that when you go up to look for your ball, which ball was the original and which one was the provisional. If a player does not announce that he or she is intending to play a provisional ball and then plays another ball, that ball is now in play. And so even if you find the original, you cannot play it because you have already put a second ball in place. All right. So you are able to play a provisional ball until that becomes the ball in play or is abandoned. One example of this is when the original ball is lost anywhere on the course except for in a penalty area or is out of bounds or when the provisional ball is played from a spot near the hole than where the ball is estimated to be. A provisional ball must be abandoned when the provisional ball, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, when the original ball is found on course outside of a penalty area before the end of the three minute search. So if you hit it in some high grass and you find it two minutes in, that provisional ball is no longer able to be played because you were able to find your original ball. Another instance when you can no longer play your provisional is when the original ball is found in a penalty area or is known or virtually certain to be in a penalty area. Uh, something that would happen is if, you know, maybe it's a dog leg and you hit your tee ball and you're not exactly sure what is around the corner and you get up there after playing a provisional and you see that there's a lake and it's, it's marked as um, a penalty area, then you are no longer able to play your provisional ball because it, it's almost certain that your original ball went into the penalty area. Uh, in either case, the player must not make any strokes with that provisional ball because it is no longer in play. And along with that, all the strokes made with that provisional ball are abandoned and they do not count, whether it was one stroke or 10 strokes. Uh, as soon as you know that that ball is abandoned, those strokes do not count towards your overall score. Uh, is there any questions on stroke and distance relief or lost ball out of bounds provisional? Okay. All right. All right, guys. So the next one we're going to cover is uh, penalty areas and Obviously, everybody kind of knows uh, what these are, so we'll, we'll jump in. Um, so the purpose of this rule is basically just to cover um, kind of the rules for, for penalty areas and, and, and uh, how to proceed from those. And, and penalty areas are basically um, always going to be considered bodies of water. Um, they also can be considered um, areas. Oh, sure. Oh, sorry. Does somebody have a question? Okay, um, so it, besides bodies of water, um, the committee always has the ability. So as I said earlier about the committee, you know that could be you guys um, if you're setting up a, a tournament. Um, you can def you can define uh, an area that maybe a ball could often be lost or unable to be played as a as a penalty area. And so uh, you do have a lot more freedom than what you had in the past. Um, in the past, it always kind of had to be water, uh, but now you can you can mark something that's that's uh, you know, a pretty, tall grass yeah, tall grass or fescue or something where, you know, a player could really have some trouble. Um, if you just want to keep play going then you can mark that area as a penalty area. Uh, for one penalty stroke, players may use specific relief options to play a ball from outside the penalty area. So that's uh, one we all know. Penalty areas, they can either be defined as either red or yellow. Um, this affects the player's relief options. And uh, 
we'll mostly cover red today, but because uh, uh, that's going to have all your options available to you, and I'll I'll mention which one's not available under uh, under yellow. So, when playing a ball from a penalty area, you are allowed to stand in a in a penalty area um, to play a ball outside the penalty area, obviously. Um, and uh, this includes after taking relief from the penalty area. So something that I didn't know, and, and you know how we've, we've been talking about taking complete relief, making sure our stance, our, our lie, and our area of intended swing are clear of, of say, an abnormal course condition. Well, in a penalty area, it's a little different because sometimes, um, you know, we might have a small sliver, small, when I say small sliver, I basically mean we have a small relief area to drop that ball in based on the angle and, and not getting closer to the hole and, and things like that. So there might be some cases where the ball might be, you might be taking relief and the ball might be in the general area, but you might be standing and your swing might still be impeded by whatever's in that penalty area. So that's something to, to know that it's okay. Um, you don't have to necessarily get your whole body and your swing and all that out of the penalty area when, when taking relief. Um, now, a ball is in a penalty area when any part of the ball lies on or touches the ground or anything else um, such as any natural or artificial object um, inside the edge of the penalty area. So obviously this ball in this picture is, is clearly inside the penalty area. Um, as we mentioned earlier, that stone wall is not going to be considered an integral object. So that ball uh, doesn't, you don't get three relief. So you got to take, take a stroke to get out. Um, it's also in the penalty area when, uh, when it's above or uh, the edge or any other part of the penalty area. So um, it's, it's kind of the same thing. It, it extends upward, like what Carly was talking about with, uh, with uh, out of bounds lines. Now, uh, the player, and this is new, so, and we've kind of been using these rules now for a few years now, but um, for those of you that played under the old rules, obviously you maybe remember you're not allowed to, you weren't allowed to do a lot. Um, you kind of had to play the ball as it lies and, and you couldn't touch anything and you couldn't ground your club. Well. Well, now uh, in penalty areas, if your ball is inside the penalty area, you can uh, obviously uh, without penalty um, remove loose impediments. You can uh, ground your club. You can take practice swings. Um, basically, you're considered uh, your your ball is basically considered part of the general area. Um, and the only thing that that changes is that if you wanted to get out of that area, you could take a drop and take a stroke. So that's that's really the only difference now. Now, if a player's ball is in a penalty area, including when it is known or virtually certain to be in a penalty area, even though not found, um, the player has these relief options. And before I go to that, I want to go back to, to known or virtually certain. And Carly mentioned this in the last one, too. But just so you guys know, known or virtually certain under the rules means that you're 95% sure that the ball has to be in there. So they have they kind of given you, a, they've given us a number and they basically said it. If you're 95% sure that that ball is in the penalty area, then 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 you can proceed uh, under the rules um, by taking relief. So there's a few area, few different ways you can take relief, and we're going to cover three of them um, here. There's a, there's another one that's part of a local rule now, but it used to be called the opposite margin uh, option, and that's that's now a local rule that you could put into place if you'd like, but it's now not one of the main three options, and so. Let's say you're you're playing this hole and you uh, hit it in the water, um, as you see in point X. Um, your first option could be to take stroke and distance relief, meaning you go back and you play from the previous spot. Um, your second option would be to find where that ball last crossed into the penalty area, and then you find the flag and you line those two points up and you go back as far as you'd like um, in line and, and drop again with one club length. And uh, which is sometimes it's to know that one um, is nice because sometimes if you're on a certain hole that has a, a steep slope behind the penalty area where you're dropping, if you, you just, if you just look back and go look maybe 15, 20 yards back, you might realize like that gets you to the fairway, might get you to a flat lie. So it's again, it's another time where you might want to be just kind of a little more careful and, and kind of look around at your surroundings before you actually take relief. Uh, the third one. 
And uh, this is the one that uh, does not is not included with yellow, but this is your this is kind of why I recommend uh, using red as much as possible because it does give you this third option, which is called lateral lateral relief. And um, basically, this gets you uh, uh, two club links relief. And this is one of the only two times that you're going to use two club links to to get away from from a from a situation. Now, if you're taking stroke and distance, you obviously uh, uh, may play the original ball or another ball. So again, you can substitute a different ball in this in this instance um, and play from where the previous stroke was made. So that either means you can re-tee, you can either drop in the general area or say the bunker under one club length, or if you're on the putting green, and and for those of you that are old enough to remember, there was a time when Tiger Woods actually putted, putted his ball, um, I think on the, I think it was at Augusta, uh, putted his ball into, the, into a creek. And uh, instead of actually taking normal relief for that and dropping, he decided to go back and, and putt from the previous spot. So, so in that case, he, he then placed the ball. Now back on the line relief, which is our second option. Um, again, here's another picture. We've, it's kind of been brought up a couple of times, but again, you see where the ball at last cross is where that red arrow is pointed in the water. Um, she then finds the flag and then she lines that up and goes back as far as she wants. So again, um, instead of taking your two club links from where it crossed and dropping it in the rough, you could go back 10, 15 yards and you can drop in the fairway and have a flat lie. So that's kind of why I said, you know, just be a little bit more careful of kind of where you're dropping and, and knowing your options. You're going to be dropping um, in a relief area and it's obviously, uh, I don't think I need to go, I think I just covered that. So I'm go to the next one. So lateral, lateral relief. And this is, as I said, you're one of your times where you're going to use two club lengths, but you're going to first find your reference point, which is always going to be where the ball last crossed the penalty area. And the size of the relief area is two club lengths and it's got a few limits. Um, basically you can't drop closer to the hole than the reference point, which we all know that. And uh, when, when you're dropping, so basically what this whole part's gonna say, and I'll kind of paraphrase, but um, when you're dropping, so let's say there's a bunker and next to the general area, so you're dropping in the general area, you wanna drop maybe in the rough. Um, and let's say there's a bunker close by and if your ball hits in, the, hits in the general area, so it's basically hitting in the rough and it bounces and it goes into the bunker, um, you're not going to actually play that ball out of the bunker. You're going to you're going to have a chance to redrop it, and because the ball first hit the general area, so wherever that ball first touches the ground, that's the area that the ball must stay in. So, so uh, in this case, you know, um, if this ball would drop and, and actually roll back, say in the penalty area, obviously he's going to be able to redrop because uh, it's it touched first touched the general area, and and obviously he's taking relief from the the penalty area, so. In that case, you know, he'd be going back into the area that he was taking relief from. All right. Um, now, if you do play from a wrong place, meaning maybe in this instance, you you took a drop from an area that maybe wasn't the right spot, um, you're gonna potentially receive the general penalty, which is gonna be two strokes. So, so really be careful where you're dropping and kind of know, uh, know the rules on, on how to find your reference point and kind of know that it, generally it's always gonna be based on where the ball last crossed the, the margin. So as long as you kind of remember that, I don't think you'll have really any trouble there. Um, so that's penalty areas. We, we covered that one quicker because we didn't, we kind of took out the yellow penalty area stuff, um, but uh, um, be happy to answer any questions on that because I know that's something that comes up a lot. And the way we mark golf courses is obviously uh, uh, an important part of that. All right, so our last one before we, we can open it up uh, a little bit more is, is something that's important, I feel like for, for really all of us. Uh, I, I've had to use this rule. Um, I, I recommend using this rule to a lot of players. Um, and it's, it's basically the two ball, playing two balls um, when you're uncertain of what to do. So um, now this is going to be just in stroke play. So when we're when we're playing stroke play, and uh, if you're, you know, let's say you're in a tournament and a referee or a committee member is not available to get to you in a reasonable amount of time to help with the rules issue, um, 
now first you're always going to be um, encouraged to help each other out you're gonna you're gonna you know ask for assistance you know obviously um, somebody in your group might know the rule and so uh, if, if they do and they're confident in that um, you know by all means uh, proceed um, you know I always recommend trying to get a, an official if you can um, but if you can't um, one thing you can't do is you can't um, just go with uh, you know find the people in your group and say you know what's just what's just agree within our with our within our group and come up with a decision because um, in, the, in the rules there's no such uh, such thing written and uh, any agreement that you guys may make could be wrong and uh, it wouldn't be binding uh, on any player or referee or the committee so um, I ideally I I like to see either you know try to get someone to come help or uh, or uh, play two balls, which we're going to cover right now. So before I do that, though, I, I do want to talk about this players, how players should protect other players in the competition. And this is part of this rule. And it talks about kind of why it's important that players kind of have the, the whole field in mind. When I say field, basically, they have everybody else in mind um, with the rules. And so why we don't really want players making decisions amongst their group is because, you know, it, it could be a wrong rule and the way you're proceeding and it could give you guys uh, so they could give that player an advantage that we don't want to give and, and we want to make the rules the same for everybody so so um, just just uh, you know keep keep in mind that uh, obviously we want you to, um, to do the right thing with uh, with the rules uh, you know don't be afraid to 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 call somebody for help um, call another coach um, anybody because you uh, you know, we want to make sure you guys are, uh, you know, proceeding correctly under the rules. Um, now, let's say you get to a point where you are uncertain. You get to that situation where, you, for example, you might be in some area of ground and repair that is not marked, and you feel like it probably should be. Um, so, how do you how do you proceed? And and uh, you first start um, by uh, um, basically uh, deciding that you want to play two balls and. And when you decide to do that, it must be um, before you've actually make that stroke at that first ball. So as you see this picture here, she's saying, you know, I've decided to play two balls and obviously she hasn't hit her first one yet. So that's kind of when you need to, to kind of make that decision. Um, you must choose uh, which ball will count um, if the rules allow for the procedure to be used for that ball. Um, and you'll be announcing that choice. So you're going to, you're going to talk to some, the other people in your group and you're going to say, Hey guys, I'm going to play uh, two balls. And um, I want this one. To, I want the first one to count. And, and so, so that's your, that's kind of the steps and the procedures you'll want to use. Um, now, if you don't choose a ball in time, let's say you play the first one and then you uh, uh, play another one. Uh, in that case, the first ball, because you didn't really choose and you didn't make that announcement, you're gonna your first ball that you played is just gonna be by default the ball that's gonna be chosen. So, in that case, uh, um, you know it would be the next slide. But but let's say you go in, you you get done with you're going into scoring. Uh, before you return your scorecard, um, you're gonna need to report all these facts, um, whether or not you scored the same score with with both balls, because the the official is going to want to make sure that you proceeded correctly, and uh, and uh, if you don't do this, you're obviously going to face a disqualification, which is it's not something that anybody wants to have to do, and definitely not on the official side. So, so uh, just be really careful, and, and you're not going to get in trouble for playing two balls. So, so don't be afraid to do it. Um, now, if if the player uh, made a stroke before deciding to play a second ball. Um, you're not going to get penalty. You're basically not going to get penalized for doing so. So, if you if you went through the whole procedure and you didn't maybe do the procedure correctly, um, you're not going to get penalized for for incorrectly uh, playing two balls. Um, you're just going to have to play the one that the first one that you played, which is that which is going to be the default ball. So don't don't be afraid uh, to do it. This is this is a rule that's there to help you, and to obviously speed up play and and allow. Uh, you guys to keep moving and, and keeping that chain together uh, of playing that hole. And the last thing I really want to say about uh, this rule is that, uh, as Carly mentioned, you know, she talked about provisional balls. Playing two balls is not going to be the same as playing a provisional ball. So this is uh, this is a little different. And 
And so that's that's the end of that. Um, you know, I, I really recommend, I'd say, uh, in your free time to go look up at the um, the the putting the putting green rules. I think that those are really important for you guys. Uh, there's a lot of things that um, that you'll have to that you will probably deal with, obviously, on the putting green accidental movement, for example, or, or say when you're marking a ball and, and uh, you know, you replace the ball and the wind moves it you know, kind of how you deal with that and, and how, you know, a lot of things that used to be penalties are not penalties anymore. So you're going to have a lot of opportunities to kind of get yourself um, out of jail and back on track. And so um, we didn't cover that today, but I, I highly recommend spending just a little time just covering just anything on the putting green. I think that's a really important um, rule and uh, something that, you know, everybody spends, I don't know how many, more than half your strokes are on the putting green. So uh, maybe not more than half, but but a lot of them are on the putting green. So it's, it's an important one to, to focus on uh, maybe in another day when, when we have some more rain. So um, love to answer any questions or, or at least try to answer them. Um, if I can, I'll get the answer to you. And then Nate, I do want to take a couple seconds to throw a few things out to the group as well. Oh, sure. After questions. Or while you guys are formulating your questions, I'll go ahead and talk. I just want to remind everybody that on the website in Varsity Bound, in the Varsity Bound forms, is where you can find the site availability form for us. So if you would like to um, offer your course to host a regional meet for us, make sure that you go into the Varsity Bound forms. I think on the far left column, once you're into your own Varsity Bound page, you'll see the IGHSAU logo. And you can select that and that should take you to the forms that you need. Also, when you log into your golf page is where you will find the rules meeting for um, boys and girls, I believe. Chad, it's in varsity bound for you guys as well. Yeah. There are separate golf meetings for boys and girls. So you'll have to watch, if you coach both, you should watch both meetings you're required to do since they, are, they have separate information prepared for it. Anything on that, Chad, that I missed? No, just, just to remind folks that uh, that on the Athletic Association side, the deadline for getting those rules meetings viewed is next Thursday, the 31st of March. We've been sending out some reminders to ADs and boys coaches, and we'll be sending out more reminders in the next few days. Uh, many, many, many folks have viewed those rules meetings, so thank you. Um, but for those who have not, who might be on the call, please take the time to, to, to get that done. Once you get to Varsity Bound, either click on the IGHSAU logo or the IHSAA logo, and then under forms, it's right there. It's, it's pretty easy. If you're a coach and by chance do not know if you have a Varsity Bound login, you will need to work with your AD to get that login secured if you're a uh, uh, coach and have not, have not used Varsity Bound before. If you'd like to get a USGA rules book, you need to go to usga.com. They're free, but you do have to pay for shipping. So uh, I know some people have called our office looking for them. We do not have them. You have to get them through the USGA. And, and actually we can, if you look at, I don't know if you can see those up on the wall there. We actually uh, are happy to send you some too. So uh, if, you, if you want us to take care of that for you, we can, we can definitely do that. Um, if you'd like. So just, we'll give our, we'll, we'll put our email up there um, at the end and then you guys um, definitely feel free to, to shoot us a message. We got a lot of them. So um, we'd, we'd be happy to send you, send you some books. And my final reminder is coaches, make sure you go and frequent the coaches pay golf page on our website under the coaches and administrators tab, select the golf section underneath that. That has memos and season information for you. So please reference that weekly. That's all I have, Nate. Okay. Oh, that was great. Um, no, we had a, we definitely uh, appreciate you guys asking us to do this. It, it kind of gets us kind of prepared for the year when you, when you haven't had to be doing any rulings over the winter. So um, kind of gets us out of our, kind of knocks the cobwebs off a little bit. So there you go. We so once we get the link from you guys of the recorded, I'll have it on our website in the coaches golf section under the coaches and administrators tab. Chad, I'm assuming you'll have it on your website as well. 
we'll we'll post it up there i think we even have the one from a couple of years ago still up there as well and 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 honestly since the 2019 rules re revision by the usga and rna uh, hasn't been much change but uh but uh, we really appreciate the uh iowa golf association doing this and just a reminder on the boys side we also use the iowa uh, uh the iowa pga and we've put numbers for both the iowa golf association and iowa pga in our rules manual so during the regular season if you have issues regarding a ruling and and can't get it uh are unable to come to a resolution among your coaches jury uh both organizations the iga and the iowa pga have offered their assistance to help uh clarify some of those rulings yeah thank you i don't see any questions in the chat section okay well, I guess for any coaches that are out there that, that uh, um, you know, whether it's boys or girls, uh, you know, if you're looking for events in the summer to, to add on and, and just give them additional opportunities to play, um, reach out to us or the Iowa PGA. Uh, we'd be happy to, to, to kind of show you what, what events are available to them in the summer. Uh, they're not necessarily all just our events, but they're, we do have a, a big list of, of events we could we could kind of share with so um, we know that's an important part of kind of growing as a player and so um, we'd like to help in that way too all right thank you all guys right. we appreciate it the yeah. time you spend with us and coaches make sure you reference this once we get it up on our website and if you don't have your team with you watching this this would be a great rainy day reference for you All right. All right. Well, thank you guys. Thank you. All right. Have a great day. You as well.